Hi everybody, welcome to the Headwater Science Center live stream. Today we are going to be talking about kind of a cool animal. For that though, uh, Headwater Science Center, we're open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday. Feel free to come on in anytime between 9.30 and 5. And on Sunday, we're open just from around 1 o'clock to 5. Okay, this might be able, you guys can hear me a little bit better then. Um, and we broadcast live streams every few days around 3.30. Uh, but yeah, so today we're going to talk about giant ground sloths, or just ground sloths in general. Um, they're a very weird animal from the last Ice Age. Um, so I've drawn uh, probably the largest ground sloth, the one that probably anyone familiar with these would be familiar with. Uh, this is Megatherium. Megatherium was a ground sloth that lived in North and South America, and it was about the size of an elephant. Uh, you don't often think of sloths, given their modern relatives, at such great sizes. But yeah, I got the person for scale. And that. So we're going to go into why some of these ground sloths got as big as they did, and what exactly they were doing ecologically. So first thing, just going to go over generally what they are. So they are, obviously, they're animals, they're mammals. They're part of a group of mammals called xenarthrins, which includes stuff like armadillos, modern-day anteaters, and the modern-day sloths. Uh, they're in the order Pelosa and the suborder Folivora. And then there's multiple families of sloths, uh, which include all the sloths we're going to talk about today and the two modern species of sloths, the two-toed and the three-toed sloths. Um, so what I was able to research, there were about six families agreed upon, um, and these sloths ranged from herbivorous to omnivorous, terrestrial to semi-aquatic to actually like climbing in cliff areas of South America. Uh, everywhere from browsers to grazers, they were incredibly diverse for a group of animals that you don't often hear about. And they're they're one of the animals from what we call the Great Biotic Interchange, uh, which is when North and South America collided about uh, 2.6 or 3.6 million years ago. And essentially animals that have been living on those two continents were suddenly able to move to new areas due to essentially the Isthmus of Panama. And generally North American animals moving south did a whole lot better than South American animals moving north. The sloths were kind of one of the two exceptions to that, and we will cover the other exception to that um, when I get back uh, in January. So, why do these sloths get so big, first of all? So at least the ones in North America were moving into a colder climate than they were used to, uh, meaning that to maintain a body temperature, they needed a little bit more mass. Um, and this is because sloths generally have a very slow metabolism. Um, they burn energy at a little bit of a slower rate than most modern day mammals do. But they also, compared to other mammals, have a lower body temperature on average, uh, around 93 degrees, uh, which just for a fun reference, if your body temperature, just to reference what Chuck did last week, went to what a sloth's body temperature rests at, you would be considered hypothermic very and it'd be a very serious medical event. So with that lower body temperature on average due to their metabolism, these animals had to get a lot bigger to handle the cold. And by becoming a lot bigger, you gotta eat more food as we covered with uh, mammoths and such. Uh, and these animals were kind of cool because they were prolific seed dispersers for, of all things, avocados. You may have noticed avocados have that very large, hard pit at the center, uh, which really no modern day herbivores can pass um which kind of led these guys to being great for them because it's a large enough herbivore where they can eat the fruit and pass that big seed out uh distributing that plant across its range um so i mentioned these animals being a little bit more diverse they weren't just uh land herbivores uh thalassocnus was a species of semi-aquatic uh brown sloth that lived off the coast of what is modern-day Peru, and it ate seagrasses and such. Uh, it was also preyed upon by certain animals at the time, which 
Another animal we'll go into at a future date is macroraptorial whales, which are large toothed whales that fed on other marine animals. There's not quite as many of them around today, uh, but they were a little bit more prolific just a few million years ago. Uh, another type of sloth that was kind of fun is the cliff-dwelling sloth, uh, which has kind of a fun name, Diabolotherium, literally meaning a devil animal, um, which were known to inhabit high cliffs and kind of carve their way into the rock with their claws. Um, so another thing, just to cover with these animals, they did range from herbivorous to omnivorous. So herbivores are animals that eat primarily vegetative matter, uh, we've covered a lot of these in the past. They'll be grazing, browsing, sometimes subterranean, going for like roots and tubers. Uh, but they're also omnivorous sloths. There's some good evidence uh, based on the examination of some of their teeth that some of these species of sloth, when they got the opportunity, would eat a little bit of meat from uh, carrion, so dead animals they would find. Omnivores are animals that eat both uh, plants and meat. Uh, sometimes in equal measure, sometimes not. Uh, which just shows uh, modern-day sloths are pretty much almost entirely herbivorous. Um, and modern-day sloths do what we call suspensorial climbing, which has often been summarized as kind of a being a living hammock, where you hang from a branch. Uh, not like a monkey or a squirrel, which is cursorial. They're on top of the branch, climbing around a bit more actively. Uh, and going into those, those two sloths aren't actually super closely related to each other. They're kind of tucked in in this group of six families, with the three-toed sloth uh, being in the Megalona. And again, apologize for my terrible Latin. One of my friends is probably laughing at me for this. Uh, Megalonicidae. So Megalonicidae is one family of sloths, where the three-toed is today. And Scler uh, Scelidonthuridae. Scelidonthuridae. Again, I didn't take Latin in high school, is where the two-toed sloth would be found genetically. And those two are the only living uh, families of sloths today. Uh, which is kind of interesting that two times in sloth's evolutionary history, uh, independently they evolved uh, suspensorial climbing. It's kind of an interesting case of parallel and convergent evolution. So another thing about these animals, uh, they lived from about 23 million years ago to just a little over 6,000 years ago. Um, these animals were pretty much exclusive to North and South America, and they were around when the first people showed up in the Americas. Um, in fact, uh, with the advent of atlatls and bows and arrows, uh, ranged tools for hunting, uh, people were able to hunt these animals. And that is one of the uh, contributing factors potentially to their extinction. Um, but that had to be another weird animal to see when you really get down to it, because it's, there, a lot of people like to point out there's no animal quite like them today. We can get a zoom in on the drawing of these guys real quick. Let's see how, yeah. What's an atlatl? An atlatl is a type of throwing tool. We can actually do a quick little, little drawing of this. So it allows you to throw a spear farther and with more force than you would to be with your own arm. So, I get the other blue marker, which I would love to actually bring up atlatls as a whole live stream. They're a good physics thing. So an atlatl is essentially, at its principle, it is a hooked stick, which the back of your spear would basically have a little kind of divot in it. And that little hook would go there, and you would hold it. And it gives you essentially a little bit more arm, a bit more leverage, to be able to fling a spear farther. And they were actually the first uh, multi, basically multi-part tool weapon system that humans invented. They're remarkably fun to use. Also, I've, I've had the chance to mess around with these a bit. And very fun. I would love to do a workshop with these at some point. Oh yeah, so people did see these, and we, oftentimes scientists like to mention that there really are no modern animals like this. Uh, much, much like a lot of the prehistoric animals we talked about for the dinosaurs, there's no really perfect analog to get a visual in our head around. But yeah, so they're an animal that had 
a lot of interesting things. And the big question about these that I always hear is, what actually happened to them? Why don't we have these? Uh, one of them would be human hunting, but the other bigger reason would be uh, the climate shifting on them near the end of the last ice age. Uh, these large animals needed a lot of food, but they were large to handle cold weather. When Basically, at the end of the last ice age, when things warmed up, the mainland sloths were a bit too big and weren't able to quite find as much food as they could in competition with some smaller, quicker herbivores who were able to take advantage of the newer ecosystem around them. And they were able to take advantage of those food sources better than these big sloths. So eventually, they went extinct. Although in the Caribbean, uh, around Cuba and other areas, just about 6,000 years ago, a, a few small populations of these sloths did actually survive until around then, where island populations tend to, if without genetic flow into them, tend to fizzle out sometimes. And that may have happened to them with a uh, basically genetic meltdown, like with the pygmy mammoths off the coast of Wrangell Island. Um, overall, they're really cool animals. We don't see them enough. Um, I think the biggest representation in media I've seen of ground sloths is Sid from Ice Age, which, um, as a kid, I totally didn't put two and two together that Sid was a ground sloth. Um, yeah. So these animals evolved this large body size to handle the Ice Age, but when the Ice Age ended, that large body size became a bit of a disadvantage. Again, answering that question where, why don't we have these giant animals still today? Being bigger, like we talked about the mammoths, isn't always better. Um, Chuck, do you have any questions about these things, or anything you want to add about them? Hmm, fascinating thing. <laughs> there are fascinating things. Is there evidence that humans hunted them a lot? Um, not heavy evidence for these being a main food source, but there is evidence of bones having little bits of cut marks on them from processing. Um, the thing is, they probably weren't ever super common. They were probably an animal that always had lower population numbers. So they probably wouldn't have needed that much extra hunting on top of the climate shifting to make it rough for these guys. What was what were their main predators? Main predators of these is hard to tell. For animals when they get to this size, oftentimes as an adult, they probably didn't have many main predators. When they were younger though, probably um there are some extinct carnivores in South America that probably were a bit of an issue. For the aquatic sloths, like we talked about, the macroraptorial whales would have been an issue. Uh, they're a type of whale we don't really have a lot today. The last one alive today is the sperm whale. Um, they were animals that were specialized in eating large body of other animals. And for these guys, when they were younger, another animal that participated in the great American biotic interchange would have been the saber-toothed cats. And those would have been a problem for these guys. These guys kind of slotted in not perfect for prey for saber-toothed cats. Like we went over in that live stream, saber-toothed cats specialized in large herbivores. So they would have been a great predator of these guys. So let me see if I got this straight. The oldest fossils for this kind, uh, the Megatherium. Uh, for Megatherium, not specifically, but for giant ground spots in general. Okay. Um, are from, found in South America? Yes, these are a South American animal that moved up into North America. They're one of the few kind of success stories of a South American animal in the biotic interchange breaking into that North American climate ecosystem. Okay, not to get too far off the subject, but oh, can you name a couple others? Uh, well, one of the others we're going to cover a little bit is the forest rockets. They're a type of large carnivorous terrestrial bird. They actually managed to do quite well, and they made it into North America. Another is a glyptodon. They're a type of relative to the armadillo. You often see them in um, museums. They had those big kind of armored bodies, with, and some of them had tail clubs like ankylosaurs. And those three are really the big success stories for a South American animal heading north and finding ecological success. Now, uh, generally, South American wildlife was a bit more isolated, as South America was kind of an island continent. The North American animals, there's a bit more biotic interchange with places like Asia and other areas, so their wildlife was a little bit, some would call it a bit more competitive. Um, 
they could stand up to a bit rougher competition, whereas the South American was much like Australia today. Um, actually, it was quite similar because there's a lot of marsupials and such. Um, actually, I guess one of the other success stories would have would be the modern day Virginia opossum. They're mm. still around. I'd argue better than these guys because we still have the opossum. Uh, the porcupines would be another one. We still have them. They're actually the largest living South American biotic interchange animal in North America. Porcupines originated in South America? Yep. I didn't know that. And they managed to be quite successful and spread around. Um, I think the largest uh, North American animal to make it to South America was the, uh, the tapir wound up being more successful in South America. And they're still there. You're blowing my mind here. I didn't know. I always thought associated tapirs with South America, and but they started in North America. Yep. It's one of those things where kind of they pulled a, the porcupine and the taper pulled a little bit of a switcheroo on us there. Um, the armadillo is another animal. We still have armadillos in North America and Central America. Basically, uh, so kind of a cool thing. So sloths are part of a family of animals we call xenarthrins. So uh, modern day armadillos, anteaters, and sloths all fall into this family of mammals. They're, they're one of those groups that where they don't look all that much like each other. But with modern genetic testing and some anatomical stuff in the jaw and the teeth structure, they're actually quite closely related. And also, uh, with xenarthrins, there's certain spinal anatomy. Their ancestral animals probably looked a lot more like armadillos or anteaters than sloths. They have a lot more reinforcement on their vertebrae for their spine, which is really good if you're a digging animal. You'll notice that moles have that today. Um, sloths are kind of the odd ones out of that family for being a bit more terrestrial, and then the ground floss broadening out into all sorts of different species that, I mean, it worked pretty, they were around for a while, but it worked pretty well for them during that time. They're just a little bit more sensitive to their ambient climate and... Wow, a giant ground sloth related, maybe distantly, but related to an armadillo? Yep, armadillos are one of those animals that when you, like, I didn't know until I took mammology, it's like, oh, there is an arthrin. Because like, they always seem like such a weird animal to think of as being related to anything else. Yeah. Um, but kind of every animal in Xenarthra kind of falls into that category of, they're too weird for you to think of, oh, it's like a close relative to this. Something we didn't cover in the mammoth or mastodon one with elephantids is they're part of a family of mammals called Afrotheres. Um, they're related to stuff like, um, aardvarks, hyrax, right. manatees. Right, And it is one of those groups of mammals where it's like, you wouldn't picture them, if you've ever seen a hyrax, they're a quite little fluffy, cliff-dwelling animal. You would never think of them as being a quite close relative to elephants, nor looking at elephants would you think, oh, they're related to manatees. And wow. manatees are an interesting one, which I might do a live stream on them. At some point. But yeah. Um, so some of you may have noticed that we switched from dinosaurs to Ice Age animals uh, recently, given we've got winter coming in here. Um, I'm going to probably keep that going. I'm going to be heading home for the holidays, though. So for the next two weeks, we're going to be taking a break from these uh, sort of prehistoric animal live streams. But when we come back, uh, we'll be going over uh, another Ice Age animal. Uh, and I will probably figure out. But over Christmas break, which one we're going to cover? There's a couple that I'm sort of debating right now. I, these are kind of for prehistoric animals. Some of my favorites is the weird mammals. They don't get talked about as much because oftentimes they fall short of the public image of like how cool prehistoric life can be compared to dinosaurs. But they're really ice age mammals were wild, as these sloths show. They got weird. <laughs> Much like the dinosaurs, they got weird. Um, in the Therizinosaurus livestream, we did compare them to these guys. They are kind of the closest comparisons to each other. And it does show how um, convergent evolution doesn't have to happen at the same time. Sometimes a niche pops up later in geologic history, and someone fills it. How long were they around? How long were the giant ground sloths like that around? So these guys were around just for a couple million years. Uh, they, when they moved into North America, they weren't quite as big. Uh, but as they moved into a colder climate, that was a selective pressure for larger body size. Um, and these ones would have gone extinct around 11,000 years ago, like a lot of that other North American Ice Age wildlife. 
Humans and a climate shift at the same time never seems to be great for large animals, uh, which is a thing pretty much most modern wildlife management people would, would say, is that you don't want to be big and you don't want to be living around humans when the climate shifts. In that hmm. case. Uh, we're a little bit better today. We don't hunt big animals nearly as much anymore, <laughs> thankfully, uh, on average. But yeah, that'll probably be about it for today's live stream.